It is wonderful that you are so engaged in what you've experienced this afternoon and the desire both to share that and to deepen your insights based on those conversations. We'd like to continue that. And uh, we are honored to have our distinguished alum, uh, Danny Lee, um, Partner Advisory Service of KPMG, who's gonna share some insights and reflections related to the question of artificial intelligence from his perspective, and then also invite your questions and observations based on your conversation and how that resonates with what he's been uh, hearing and experiencing as well. Danny. Hi there. Uh, again, my name is Danny Lee. Uh, I'm a double alum of Loyola, and I'm very, very, very happy to be here. Um, and uh, I'm currently a, a partner with KPMG. And those of you who don't know, it's a big four accounting firm. I've been with the firm for a um, long time, long time, over 25 years. Um, my area of uh, focus has been around uh, cybersecurity and uh, IT controls and IT assurance. So I, I deal with IT, and primarily, as you know, for a company like KPMG, we're really talking about the numbers, the financial numbers, the financial reporting. And the most important thing is, how do you get assurance out of that? How do you get comfort out of the numbers being correct? Well, this day and age, a lot of that is driven by not just computers, but artificial intelligence. So how do you develop trust in that number? And that number is not just reporting on a value of a stock or the type of expenses that you're booking. It's really making decisions, as we heard earlier, about people's lives. But even today, it's making decisions about what we should watch, how we should buy, what route we take on a taxi or on a Uber or whatever brand you'd like. So there's a lot of things that it's already affecting us today. And you've probably heard that in the media they talk about the recruiting engine at Amazon, right? That using machine learning, looking at back historically, it deciphered this trend that really engineers should be men and not women. So is that the right answer? Of course not. So it's built into the data and how do you trust that data as you go forward? Um, Google, when they're looking at search engine, you ask for certain names, it gives you results that are geared towards certain cultural uh, biases. So lots of that exists today and it's driven by that historical data, that machine learning, that ultimately gives you the AI, right? So you gotta look at the whole process, the whole lineage and the provenance of the data. Well, it just it happens, uh, KPMG this year is uh, launching our new service area called uh, KPMG AI Trust. Now, I'm not here to sell that to you, I'm actually here to share with you what our thinking is. We've uh, done some surveys over the last couple of years around AI and what it means to trust AI. And so we have a white paper out there. It's, uh, again, it's not selling, it's just data that we've, we've studied and gathered from 3,000 executives worldwide, over nine different countries, about what they think of, of, of trust in AI. So I'll just, you guys have talked amongst yourselves, so I'll just share with you some of the stats and maybe it'll help you. Um, only one third of the respondents, which by the way are um, middle senior management and up, believe that AI has, can make decisions, one third. So two thirds are weary of it, but it's all, but everybody's using it. Um, they believe that AI's biggest transformative use is in reputation, enhancing reputation, driving customer satisfaction and loyalty, Inspiring employees, so there's a lot of use of AI for employee engagement, right? And then uh, reaching global markets. These are the areas that AI is really being applied today. And all of the executives that we, we surveyed, a large amount of them believe that this is a technology issue. So now you start to see there's a little bit of a problem here because the technology is being implemented by people, but the goals for that technology are not necessarily always done by the technologists. So when you really think about AI, we believe that there's a framework that an organization needs to adopt that looks at both people, process, and technology. It's just not a technology question itself. 
notwithstanding the fact that there's a life cycle and how you manage that. Another interesting aspect is um, there are actually differences of opinion in terms of trusting AIs market to market, jurisdiction to jurisdiction in different parts of the world. So 65% of respondents in India have a high level of trust in AI. 21% of respondents have a high level of trust in the US. So Americans don't really trust AI as much as, well actually the Indians trust it three times as much, basically, right? So that's very interesting. Uh, another question we asked was, who's to blame if something goes wrong with AI? And the example that was used was autonomous driving. That's right around the corner. In fact, in many instances, it's already here, right? Uh, who's to blame? It's the software developer, according to this survey. So again, there's already some biases in the world about who to blame, who's responsible, what's gonna work and what's not gonna work. And as you will see in many of you in corporate America and also in this fine institution, you'll see that biases are a big deal right now. You are studying biases not just within technology, but within our philosophy, within our dealings of daily business. Uh, at our firm, we just rolled out a training for everyone that's focused on um, vetting our day-to-day our, uh, uh, -day business bias, and we use a seeds method, which you guys may have heard of. In any case, um, the, another issue that we found out in our survey with uh, AI machines is what we call the super, the sub, and the bad human problem. So the super problem is when a robot or an AI is too good, it's too transparent, and it comes out with an answer that's over the top, that's not really what you want. For example, it looks at the history and it says, you know what, women shouldn't be engineers. That's what it is. Well, is that a, is that a correct answer? No, it's too transparent. It's bringing back all those biases that's embedded in the data that we as humans have kind of, kind of overlooked or maybe even avoided. But now, because it's a computer, it becomes very, very transparent. Then there are subhuman errors. Subhuman errors that when, when a computer is being trained and it has not been trained thorough enough and it doesn't recognize certain things. Like, for example, an example was provided that it didn't recognize the difference between a turtle and a motorcycle because the trainer didn't go through those examples. Right? So, Things that we take for as commonsensical, the computer or the AI can't distinguish. Those are subhuman problems. And then there's the bad human problems, the ones that where they're making decisions that have an adverse effect on, on us. Right? So those are basically taking actions that are either um, prejudicial, racial, or whatever else uh, that would basically hurt all of our chances as a community. So that there are these types of problems we see as being prevalent problems also. So how do you address this? And uh, one interesting example that we came up with or we identified was one that Microsoft had come up with. And let me just share that with you briefly here. They have a, uh, a principles base for designing AI. And many companies out there do that now, but they have basically this idea of fairness accountability, transparency, and then ethics, which they, there's an, you know, it's a tech company, so there's an acronym. Fairness, F, accountability, A, transparency, T, and ethics is E, so fate. That's their, that's their, that's the name of it. So um, we at KPMG, we, we come at it a little bit different, but essentially we have also a method of, of doing that. So when you talk about ethics, sometimes it gets a little, philosophical, a little lofty. But in a business context, there's always a business objective and a business outcome you're trying to achieve. So for us, we take a look at those business objectives, we break those objectives down to how they're being measured, and based on those metrics, we understand the attributes of those metrics and where that data is coming from, and then we go into that data set and we look at where that data comes from we look at the controls around that data. 
We look at the practices of cleaning that data, the governance of that data. We also look at the technologies being deployed, the logic. And usually we expect that there are several different scenarios that are being tested or otherwise called controls, control scenarios where you have expected results. You'd run these scenarios and you'd see what the, the AI would produce. And if there are variances, you'd have to go back and fix that. So my point there is, even for accountants, there are ways to break down ethics at the very minimum into key attributes and key uh, analytical methods that you can test the effectiveness of the AI. This is actually very important. And that's why we think eventually, we're, as consumers, we're going to need assurance. You need comfort that that AI is actually working as intended. Who's going to provide that independent view? Hopefully, someone like us. But um, suffice it to say is that the ethics bit of AI is alive and well in business today. I've just shared with you what we do as a service provider. I've shared with you what a leading technology company is doing within their organization. I've shared with you a little bit about the survey that we've had with different executives, what the fault and blames are. So I'll pause there and kind of take questions and answers now, just to give you a bit of a dialogue on based on your own discussions. First of all, thank you very, very much. I just want to go through your listing of fairness. I understand that. I understand accountability, great transparency. But the third one is ethics. Right. I'm not sure. I, by the way, I teach ethics. Yeah. So I'm not sure what you mean because that's a whole area. So what does that mean for you specifically? Perfect. Thank you for asking that question. Kind of teed it up for me. So um, today, you know, I, I graduated Loyola philosophy degree, right? I, I studied ethics. I was uh, here. Ethics uh, from a philosophical perspective is a much more complex concept. Uh, there are different models of ethics right, that are applied. And in the business world, really ethics as it's practiced today could be said more about compliance. Right? So if you have a fairness act of employment, housing, there are certain parameters that are um, suggested, provided, or dictated in those regulations or those guidance that we as businesses need to interp interpret and create rules around that to achieve that outcome. Right? Much of the ethics that are being applied today is driven by both regulatory compliance, legal requirements, and then they sort of build that in and get numbers out of that. And at that point, as an organization, many organizations or mature organizations have something called risk management. So basically, they have a view of how much risk they're willing to tolerate against reputational loss, brand, and anything else. And that then becomes the softer number that either moves that number up and uh, softer threshold that moves that number up or down the scale. And when you have that, that's your threshold for doing sort of analytical view of ethics. Does that, does that help? Very, very good beginning. Thank you. Okay. So that's, that's, unfortunately, that's the practice we have today. They've not been able to put utilitarianism or totalitarianism to play yet. Um, so my question has to do around, you mentioned you, know, you guys take some control over the data that's coming in, right? And cleaning that up. Where, I'm trying to figure out the best way of asking this, sorry. Um, where do the ethics fall as far as like the example of Uber, where the data is really coming from its 20 million drivers, right? That are feeding it the data that is making Uber the business that it is. Yep. And it's a company that is planning to go public, you know, next year at a hundred and twenty billion dollar valuation, but yet the people who fed it the information, the data to make it what it is, like they're not gonna Perfect. see any of that. So where are the ethics in, the, in that kind That's of data? That's a great question. That's a terrific question. That's a question that we all deal with today. So for those of you who are aware, there's a regulation out there called GDPR, which is a European uh, Data Protection Act versus the US. And there are fundamental differences in how the European Union and Americans see data. 
So in America, I give you free access to go check on your buddies from high school, work, wherever, and I own that data. But you get free access. I provided you a service, and in return, you paid me with your likes and your smiles and your balloons and whatever else, right? So that's mine now. Data is mine. But by the way, I'm going to give you some bit of privacy, quote unquote, around that, but I still own it. That's the US kind of model today. In Europe, no. You are a natural person. You created data. That data is a reflection of you. And any combination of there is personal to you. And so you own it. We are merely the custodian, controller, provider for it, right? And we have a responsibility to you. And when you want to move that data, there's a portability that you can take that data in whole and go somewhere else with it. That business model is a different business model. That business model says they're providing a service. The one in the US is they own the data. We haven't resolved that. Now, is that ethical or not? Well, there's no laws in place yet for that. And this is to the other question earlier. There has to be regulation and laws that somehow get into that. Otherwise, you know, at, at the end of the day, it's kind of hard to measure that. Now, even in today, though, in the US, you see certain businesses take different positions. So Apple, you know, standing up and saying, well, we're going to give you your data. We're not abusing your data. In fact, um, that was uh, at the recent conference where, you know, Tim said, basically, we're not like the other guys, right? But, you know, so why is because Apple is able to just make money on its own product. It's not making money by selling data like the other two, F and G, right? The other fan companies, right? So, so there's a business model difference there that, that they're reconciling with, but even in the US, there is a struggle there already. And as long as they're using your data, but they're not abusing your identity, is it, is it really fair or not fair if they told you they, you know, they give you connectivity for free, we just want your data and we'll anonymize it. So anyways, I'll pause there.